grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today as we approach the uh, spring semester break for Holy Week and Easter, I want to use these few minutes for two things. First, I want to read from the Gospel according to St. John, a rather lengthy and thoroughly familiar scripture, one of the appointed texts for today from the Daily Lectionary. The 10th chapter begins as John is quoting Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Then uh, John continues explaining, this figure, by way of explanation, Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not heed them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and to find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd who is on the sheep or not sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will heed my voice. So there shall be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now that's the end of the assigned reading from John's Gospel, and so having read these words, I've already completed the first goal I've set for today's homily. The second <laughs> is to say a few words about this text, indeed to say very few words. My reason for wanting to say very little is not that there's very little that can be said about these words of our Lord. It is surely arguable that the parables of Jesus and the metaphors about shepherds and sheep and doors and thieves sneaking by other ways than the front door are deceptively simple. A good deal could be said by way of explanation about these words and interpretation. And there are those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of sin and grace, of Good Friday and Easter, as too simple, as too easy, as too naive and uncomplicated to be taken seriously. I have known several such people, and you probably have known others. We are especially likely to encounter such critics of the Christian faith in academia, where we take positive delight in disabusing ourselves of the easy answers and conventional wisdom. Perhaps we might just suggest to such persons who think that the faith is too easy and too simple 
that the simplicity of Jesus' words quoted here by John is by no means all there is to the Christian faith. Those who find the faith too simple and want to trade up for a worldview that is more sophisticated, more cynical, or at least more complicated, may well be stereotyping the faith of the church with an indelible character based solely upon a Sunday school paradigm that they learned many years ago. And such persons, I think, need to be told that if they probe deeply enough, their Christian concerns can lead to a lifetime of intellectual challenge to accompany a lifetime of spiritual challenge. There's plenty there for all of them and for their life. But I'm already in danger of saying too much. I am not now concerned about the danger of deceptive simplicity, but rather about an equally deceptive and equally dangerous complexity. If for some persons the Christian faith appears too simple, for others, and perhaps for all of us at least part of the time, the commitment to the faith does not look easy at all. We know we have not measured up to our faith. And our confessions of sin confront and challenge constantly, again and again, our confessions of faith. And as year follows year, Lent follows Lent, our failures and our weaknesses become clearer and clearer. At such times, and that time is, I believe, right now, it's probably important that we be more wary of deceptive complexity than of deceptive simplicity. We do not, at this point, need long explanations or persuasive arguments. We can probably get along without theological profundity or complexity. There are times better attuned to hearing than speaking, to wonder rather than explanation, to simple religion rather than complex theology. Today, as we get ready to go home to Holy Week and Easter, this day may be the time to hear simply once again I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Hearing that, perhaps the only other word to say today is the Christian word of response. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. We thank you especially today for the sunshine you blessed us with, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercy truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but also in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all your days. Today we pray especially for your comforting hand to be placed on Ed and Mary Sagasted as they grieve the loss of their mother and grandmother. Also, be with Mary Mergenthal and Chris Barson in their recovery. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Our closing hymn, What Wondrous Love. We'll all sing the first and last stanzas, and we'll have the women sing the second and the men the third. <laughs>
themselves as low as one or two. And, uh, so, how do you rate yourself this morning? Are you up or are you down? Maybe sneaking up because break time is here. For a few moments this morning, I'd like to invite your attention to a theme such as this. Use your emotions as resources for good. Don't use chemicals for false support that only destroy. Let's get to the confession right off. My confession comes first. I'm a slave to the bottle. Let me rephrase that. I'm a slave to this bottle. Why? Well, something happened. So I have to carry this bottle with me wherever I go until the day I die. What's in it? Small tablets of nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin that is the base for dynamite that blow up and destroy. But in these pills, it's the base for something else called vasodilator. It widens the lumen of the blood vessels. So here I am, bottle in pocket, wherever I go for the rest of my days. Why? Well, this Augsburg athlete of 1843 played, <laughs> played basketball and tennis, and we beat everybody in the conference except St. Olaf in those days in tennis. Would I be victim to a heart attack? Well, it happened, but a little over a year, as some of you know, sitting right there at my desk, because all of us from age two start building up those little platelets in our arteries and vessels and whammo. It can happen to anyone. It happened to me, and I didn't know that the rate of those who are victims of heart attacks, 50% don't have a second chance. I thank the Lord that I got a second chance, but I'm a drug user. Now, I haven't broken the seal. I'm glad every time I don't have to. But it says here, one tablet under the tongue as needed for chest pain. I haven't had to use any until I went to St. John's with three lovely Augies and hollered too loudly at the referee who was so un unfair to us. It wasn't really what brought it on, but I didn't tell him. But I did have a pain that night, and so I had to resort to some of this stuff. I'm a drug user to stay alive. I take three other pills every day. None of these, I hope. My concern today is for those among us who use drugs to, for whatever reason, as a crutch to escape because of boredom or whatever. Uh, some of you remember a few years ago, maybe you've seen the reruns of that funny TV program, Get Smart. But a dumb, bumbling agent that fellow was. I've even forgotten his number, but the girl's number was 99, agent 99. Anyway, what was impressed on my mind from that TV show was that phrase, this message will self-destruct in 15 seconds. The message was played, and then the tape recorder would blow up. To me, that's an image of some people's lives who are on that path of self-destruction something is going to blow up. We do have to admit today that one of the modern plagues in our midst is that of chemical dependency, be it drugs or alcohol. And it isn't simply a localized problem. I can recall filming in Papua New Guinea, north of Australia, not far from where there are still a few remnants of cannibalism. And as we needed to exchange our money, we went into the local bank way up in bonds, Highlands, and as we walked in to change our traveler's checks, the bank was just loaded with local uh, New Guineans in all forms of dress and undress. They just sold their coffee and had come into the bank to cash their checks. They went right across the street to the liquor store and bought those big cases of the hard stuff to take it home. It's such a problem in Papua New Guinea today and other places. I've visualized that island floating away in high spirits, destroying people's lives. 
last week's time, not this week, but last week, the feature article was Drugs on the Job. I invite you to look it up with the subtitle, Battling the Enemy Within. I recall one comment made there that the, com the costs of drug abuse on the job today are costing the U.S. economy $60 billion a year. Besides the other consequences of drug abuse, ranging from the accidents on the job to theft, to bad decisions, and of course to lives being destroyed. The National Institute on Drug Abuse last week estimated that nearly two-thirds of the people now entering the workforce have used illegal drugs, and 44% of them have taken them during this past year. Many professional people are on this route of self-destruction, not only out of the factory in the warehouse, but within the office. An attorney in New Jersey last year spent $60,000 freebasing cocaine. That is another image in my mind where I was with the, the heroin addicts in Hong Kong. 80,000 of them freebasing their drugs as they said, flying the dragon, and they allowed us to take pictures. But the Lutheran Church is there trying to help some of these people. Well, this particular attorney was so trapped and had used it so long that uh, he, of course, was seeing and imagining many things that people were out to get him, and he was covering the windows of his home and covering him up with sheets and the people, the invisible people were coming right through the walls to get him. Fortunately, someone directed him to a group of people that could help him, a group similar to Alcoholic Anonymous. Today this fellow is back on the job, but you know what he says? I was one of the lucky ones because so many of my friends with whom I got high today With all of this fuss now about testing for drugs to find users and abusers, whether among athletes or among workers, U.S. employers are striking back at this present drug plague with a new kind of test. Here's a question. Do coke heads have hot hair? While people are pro protesting your analysis, a Los Angeles chemist has developed a new test for drug screening, checking hair. I can escape, there's hardly any left. <laughs> but anyway, scientists have discovered that human hair holds a permanent record of all chemicals that a person has taken. The test utilizes radiation on human hair, revealing not only what drugs were taken, but even shows when the chemicals were consumed. Now, as David would say, that's hairy. Result, more companies require job applicants to prove that they are drug-free. It will become increasingly difficult to use drugs and to make a living. Question, what does one do then to avoid self destruction. Who is really on a high? Well, as Christians, we know something about who we are and where we're going. We have the possibility of assurance that we can be, no matter where we rate ourselves on that chart of one to ten. We can make it as we use our emotions as good resources. While some prefer to rebel, I heard that just the other day downstairs, I'm still rebelling. You know, in the Old Testament, they call that stiff-necked people. Today, I call it blockheads. We just won't give in. We're going to do it our way. Don't care how good old Frankie's voice is, he's going to do it his way. A good voice, he's a good singer, but boy, that philosophy sure gets people in trouble. In closing, just four items, I won't explain them, I'll just list what can help each one of us to prevent.
prevent falling away, as even some of the disciples did, who had the privilege of being in the very presence of Jesus and yet fell away. One, let your emotions be supportive, not destructive. But the Lord does indeed desire for every one of us the abundant life. Not the abundant life the TV ads are trying to give us, but the abundant life the Lord promises. Use our emotions to support us. Secondly, let the Lord change the focus of our lives, which naturally humanly is always here on ourselves. Change that focus outward to others in the process we find ourselves. Thirdly, you are person of worth. We need to be reminded of that every day from the Lord's word. And in prayer, in communication, I'm a believer in the power of prayer. I was prayed into world missions by a grandfather and a mother, and I rebelled along the way, but I've been blessed for all my days by the power of that prayer, and I've been sustained by it to this day. Prayer is a power. Use it. Feed that spiritual life with it. Fourthly, in our strategy for proper change and growth, let us relate to one another in love. Living together with all the ups and downs, we can make it together as we put our trust and our confidence in the Lord. In the Lord, our emotions are our best resources. Put my bottle away. I say humbly, but I say honestly, in the Lord, no matter where I am on that chart, every day I'm on a high with the Lord. I hope you are too. Amen. Shall we pray? Is an episode out of the life of Christ that occurred early in his ministry. Jesus and his disciples were fresh from the miracle at Cana, and together they were working the country of Judea, making and baptizing disciples. And they decided to go to Galilee, and they had to pass through Samaria. So they came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, which is near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob was there. And we pick up the story in the fourth chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me? A woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaria. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself with his sons and his cattle? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is the text for springtime. And Christ offers to dwell in us as a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a spring. A real big out of doors spring. About eight or nine years ago, Mary, my wife, such an experience that we will probably never forget. 
with our daughters. We have ended up with a family from Montana. We have trekked back to a high altitude lake with a lovely name of September Long Lake. Made our base camp there. We're going to be there about four or five days. And in the middle of such a trek, we plan a day with nothing planned. People can do what they wish, swim, fish, sunbathe, read, snooze, or go off on side treks as long as they don't go away. Mary and I looked across the lake and saw a rise of about 150 feet, 200 feet. We wondered what the view would be like up there. It's always the urge in the mountains to see what can you see from the next ridge. And on this bright, sunshiny day, we went off with our filled canteens and our snacks and climbed up to the top of that and found a beautiful little meadow sloping land, a high bench on the south side of the lake. We could see to the west the trail winding up to Sundance Pass, another lovely name, from which on another day we took across country on a boulder scramble to the top of Silver Run Mountain. Whoever named those places was a poet. To the south we could see a gigantic granite spire hard by Thunder Mountain that the Indians called the Bear's Tooth that gave a name to this great mountain southern Montana. But to our wondering eye, to our ineffable surprise and joy, we found up there on that high bench a gigantic spring. It seemed to come straight out of a rock fall at the other side, and it flowed almost arrow straight across that gently sloping terrain, not deep, about a half span in depth, about a yard and a half wide. A delight to the eyes that it sparkled and danced in some Delight to the ears as it gurgled and bubbled its way. Delight to the taste because it was clean, pure, and a delight to the touch because it was cool and refreshing. A pure gift of God's grace, like so many countless gifts of God's grace in the natural world around us. And whenever I read this story of the Samaritan woman, I think of that spring. Whenever I think of that spring, I think of the story of the Samaritan. Now, hydrologists could explain that spring, and they would be right. And should that spring ever shut down, be turned off at some point, hydrologists could explain that too. But now the imagery weakens, because the hydrologists would invoke natural causes, not man-made causes. And it behooves us to consider from time how we could dampen or turn off that spring of living water that Christ says he wants to be a part of us. And when we think about that, we ask, how can we do that? Well, we do it the old-fashioned way, by sin. <laughs> now, I don't hear very many sermons on sin. Maybe I'm not listening. I attribute the decline in the number of sermons on sin possibly to the decline of the population of experts. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I stand before you as an expert on sin. I'm not a theoretician, you understand. I'm an experientialist. I've been doing it for years. <laughs> now, pastors tell me that there are people that they talk to who say they can't remember when they last sinned. A week ago, a month ago. And I'm wondering, what list are they working from? <laughs> well, if you work from the list of the Ten Commandments and sneak by the first, you probably come out fairly well. I mean, I go to church on Sunday. That's remembering the seventh day to keep it open. I don't curse. Oh, once in a while something slips up. I honor my father and my mother, even though they've been dead for 40 years, I still thank the Lord. And you can honor your father and your mother by maybe even writing them a letter from time to time. I don't lie. Very often. <laughs> <laughs> I don't steal. I really don't steal. Material things, at least. I don't murder. I don't covet my neighbor's wife or manservant or maidservant or cattle. I don't have any. So, you know, when you think about it over that list, you can come out looking pretty good. But it's not the only list. Paul had a number of lists scattered throughout his letters. And in the 
the early church people took sin seriously, and they worked on those lists that down through the centuries there has come to us, a particular list, any one of which can turn off that spring of living. They call them the seven deadly sins. Why are they deadly? Because they kill. What do they kill? They kill relationships. They kill my relationship with God. They kill my relationships with people, including those that I would love the most. And they kill my relationship with nature. The first one is pride, the parent of all the rest. Pride. Pride is the quintessential sin against the first commandment which says, Thou shalt have no other God before me, and here I am saying, Ah, but there is another one. I'm in. Pride is very important to us. We dress it up. We dignify it. We talk about false pride as if there were any other kind that's good. And I've committed that when one of my daughters <coughs> has done something that at least I as a father think is particularly meritorious. I will say, I am very proud of you. But what I really should be doing is taking that daughter by the hand and standing before the throne of grace and saying, Praise the Lord for the gifts that have come our way by means of which we can serve the Lord. Pride. One of the deadly sins. It's the father of envy. Envy. Pride says, I am a God. Envy says, no one else is. How dare you be better than I in sports? studies, or looks, or friends, or material goods, or whatever. We can't dignify it. Pride is like acid dripping slowly in those ties that are supposed to bind our hearts in Christian love. It destroys relationships. You cannot pray with someone about who you are envious. And my friends, that is the litmus of how much you are in the grip of one of these sins. Your ability to pray with someone or for someone. The third on the list is anger. Now that's one that I've practiced a lot. The Bible says be angry and sin not. You can't do it. I can't. However hard I try to separate my anger against the deed from my anger against the doer, I never and I can't pray with someone against whom I have anger. It kills relationships. It dampens that spring of water that is within us. Anger. The fourth is sloth. Sloth. <laughs> Nothing you can do with sloth that makes it nice. It's the sin of laziness. And I figure I'm not going to find these all three because I do not consider myself a lazy person. I don't think any of you do. But there are various forms of sloth. It's not just lying in a hammock. There's moral sloth, for example, where we just sort of say nothing about those things that go on in our society that produce moral rot and decay. Sloth. It breaks relationships because it's lazy about them. Avarice, the fifth of the seven deadly sins. Avarice is sort of the, the long-range planning action of pride. Avarice says, the pride says that I am a god, and therefore everything on my want list has a right to be on my needs list. Avarice just takes without regard to people, without regard to nature. 2,700 pairs of shoes come to mind <laughs> until I open my own closet door, and I got more shoes there than I can wear at one time. <laughs> I've got more records than I can play at one time. Avarice. It destroys relationships, and it begins the destruction of a relationship with nature, because it takes without any thought of stewardship for those who walk. Sixth is gluttony. Now, if 
Avarice is pride's long range. Gluttony is pride's immediate now. Gluttony has no past, it has no future. Gluttony is slit eye. Doesn't even see people around, let alone have relationships with others. Mindless of God, it's mindless of nature. And it's not just eating and drinking too much. We can be gluttonous about space, about time. You ever owned a boom box and wanted to play it at full volume without regard to the needs of others to study? Or to say nothing of their tastes in music? <laughs> it destroys relationships. It dampens that spring of living water within us. The last is lust. Did you ever think you could pray with and about someone against whom you have lust directed? The one sin where either directly or indirectly you must have the cooperation of someone else in sin. And if in time you repent of that, then what of the other person? You're not only destroying your own relationships, you're making relationships with someone else. Very difficult to correct. These are the seven deadly sins of the world. Pride. sees that Easter glory as we live with this spring of water in us, sparkling, bubbling, giving us a zest for life that just transcends the understanding of other people. I pray that all of you, Christ may be with you. God, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts for this past week of refreshment and peace in the course of our busy lives. For those who travel, we thank you for their safe return. We pray now that as we head into the last half of the semester, we can be open to your goodness and your creation and all your many blessings. Direct us in all our doings with your most gracious favor and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you. We may glorify your holy name and finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I think John is the only person that has ever given a homily in the game room here. Last year, I think it was, we had a tornado alert right at the time of chapel, so we all moved to the game room, and it was fantastic. I got to say something. <laughs> When I grew up, my mother said, don't ever go to where they play pool. <laughs> <laughs> and she would have been proud <laughs> the first time I was in a pool hall. She was chapel talk. <laughs> and interestingly enough, there were many requests to pull chapel there from that point on. <laughs> um, we are running a little short of time, but I, the, the last hymn is such a great hymn, we have to sing all stanzas. So if you have to leave, uh, leave while we're singing. I also want to point out that John, some of you don't know how involved our faculty are in their local congregations. And John was president of Central Lutheran Church, the big church downtown where Evan Vespers is held uh, in the last, uh, recent past, the last couple of years. So a lot of these things never come out until I tell you. <laughs> so, we are very grateful for that as well. Please stand and let's sing How Great Thou Art. Yeah. 
It is kind of neat because uh, Jim was talking about the introduction, but the bottom line was you'll notice that I get the privilege of getting up here last. <laughs> and uh, so Jim uh, was very kind and forthright in uh, that introduction uh, containing some certain half-truths, which I won't tell you the difference. But I, uh, I do appreciate it, but I also know that I was coming up behind him. Uh, Jim made some allusion to this business about judging. I think maybe I should lay that out a little bit to the truth, and, and uh, I can do that, I think, by, well, by telling the story. In your uh, program for this morning, there's a little reference to the fact that I was born and raised in Carthage, South Dakota, and that's very true. And I uh, was born and raised in an area where was the heart of the pheasant hunting country of South Dakota, and we were greatly devoted to hunting pheasants. I had a friend named Ed Goss. Ed uh, always hosted a lot of... Uh, lawyers from the Twin Cities would come out to Pheasant Hunt uh, during the hunting season. Yet, uh, did this and the lawyers appreciated it, so one year the lawyers bought a very fine hunting dog and brought that dog out to Ed in an appreciation for what the lawyers had done for him. Ed named the dog Lawyer. And uh, the lawyer was a very hard, hard working dog. He could point, he could uh, retrieve like no other dog you've ever seen, and you've never seen a dog that would work as hard as Boyer always worked. And each year, the hunters would return, and they would enjoy going out hunting, and with the hard work of Boyer, they were very successful in that which uh, they could do because of the hard work of Boyer. Well, it seems that one year, Ed had a high privilege. This goes back a few years, but you will recall that uh, the late uh, Vice President Hubert Humphrey also came from the state of South Dakota. And one year, uh, the Vice President made a determination that he should take several of the uh, well-known people from uh, Washington, D.C. to South Dakota so that they could enjoy the fruits of the great pheasant hunting that occurred out there. So the vice president came there with the president of the United States, Dad Goss's farm, and they went pheasant hunting. And they had hunted. And uh, in the process of that, of course, the, the attorneys from the Twin Cities were called, and they were asked, please don't come this year. The uh, president, the vice president, are coming to go hunting. And and the lawyers uh, from the Twin Cities, of course, they thoroughly understood that. They appreciated it. Uh, it came the following year. And the lawyers from the Twin Cities came back out to uh, Ed Goss's farm in South Dakota to go pheasant hunting, and they got all their equipment, all their fancy brown uniforms and their guns and their shells and everything. They got all set to go hunting, and they said, uh, we're all set to go, but, uh, but uh, where's a lawyer? That, that's the hardest working dog we've ever seen. We've got to have a lawyer if we're going to go hunting. Ed said, uh, he's out behind the barn. He's no good. What do you mean he's no good? He, he was such a hardworking dog. And uh, Ed looked back and he said, well, that, that's true. But remember last year, the president was out here, and the lawyer went hunting for the president. The president was so impressed with what he did that uh, he changed his name to Judge Nozzle. He does said he's a rear bark. <laughs> <laughs> it's been said with tongue-in-cheek, I'm sure that nothing succeeds like success. Perhaps no virtue is sought after with as much intensity by contemporary Americans as success. This elusive quality is pursued by men and women alike in every walk of life. Now that we have a lot of yardsticks to measure success, Academy Award, Super Bowl victory, winning the election, passing a test, asking a girl or a guy for a date, and they're saying yes. Success has many definitions. The dictionary says that it is the degree or measure of attaining a desired end, a favorable termination of a venture, specifically the attainment of wealth, position, esteem, favor, or eminence. I hate to disagree with Webster, but such a definition is not completely accurate. It does not cover every contingency. Is a wealthy man a successful man? Prior to his death, John Paul Getty, then the wealthiest man in the world, stated that his wealth could not preserve a happy marriage. 
popular bestsellers such as Rich Man, Poor Man, and For Blood or Money point to the emptiness of riches. Is a popular man a successful man? The suicides of actor Freddie Prinze or rock queen Janis Joplin in my life indicate a negative answer. David Kennedy, the son of the late United States Attorney General and candidate for president, was found dead in a poor hotel room from an overdose of drugs. Although he belonged to one of the wealthiest and most prestigious families in the world, a friend said of him, he had no one to plug into. Is a powerful man, a successful man. We only have to look to Watergate for an answer to that question. Or to others in the political arena. Herbert Norman, he was an ambassador from Canada to Egypt, stepped from a roof of an eight-story building, and there was a note in his pocket that said, I have no option. I must kill myself because I live without hope. The world's formula for success has been summed up like this. Work hard, earn lots of money, and consume as much as possible. Be successful, achieve status, get on top. The formula though followed by many, does not guarantee a life which reflects the American dream. Or how about this success formula? Think of a product that costs a dime to make, sells for a dollar, and is half for me. Time Magazine reports that singer Rod Stewart is a millionaire, travels in his own jet, owns a huge mansion in England, says he has everything, he ever dreamed of. Is he successful? Listen to his answer. I'm so tired, I really don't care. This is a sad business I'm in. Gail Sheehy's book, Passages. Faculty members in the audience have read that, the rest of you have. Mentions a well-known television newcaster who is wealthy, attractive, and powerful. He's young and he's on top of his profession. Is he successful? These are his words. I'm near the top of the mountain that I saw as a young man. And it's not snow. It's mostly salt. Most guys that I talk with that are successful, whatever successful, left their personal lives way behind them. Professionally, they're terrific, but their personal lives are in a mess. If these reflections on success are not viable, how should we, as professing Christians, if indeed we are, find success? As mentioned earlier, Webster states in part that success is attaining a desired end. For a Christian, that desired end is found in the handbook for living, the Bible. It tells us that our chief purpose is to glorify God. Other goals, while important, are regulated to lesser positions. Seek ye first, we're told, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Is it important that we recognize that success for a Christian does not necessarily mean material wealth? Some of the men used by God in mighty ways have died with few worldly possessions. The most obvious example of such success in spite of rejection, 
poverty by secular standards is Jesus Christ himself. We must grasp the importance of giving up personal rights when to assert them would weaken the cause of Christ. Basic to Christian success is the willingness to die to self. The psalmist says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. God guarantees success to those who obey him, who read his word and meditate upon it. Eternal success is well within the grasp of each of us. How eagerly we should strive for that ultimate reward, to be greeted one day with these words, well done, a good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the master. Let us pray today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for allowing me to be on this campus with these people, for the warmth of the welcome, for the inquiring minds, for the leadership in pursuit of excellence. Bless the efforts, O Lord, of those who will continue to educate, to be educated here at Augsburg. We ask you to forgive us for at times being more concerned with worldly success than with walking in obedience to your will. We pray that Jesus might truly become Lord of all, that we are in him, and that we might be strengthened and filled with your Holy Spirit to live for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name. Let's sing and praise God from whom all blessings flow, as Tom and Steve prepare to do. Simon Street. Please stay if you can for this fine original composition.